Alright, welcome back. If you've been here before. If you haven't been here before, welcome to the show. Um, getting straight into it because I've already wasted heaps of time sitting around, dicking around on my phone. Um, I'm going to turn you around and show you what we're working on. Alright, so I'm working on this bloody monster today. It might not look like much, but it is huge and it is heavy. Um, when I first saw it, I thought it was going to be actually old. But based on the sticker that's on the back, it was manufactured in 2015. So not old at all. Um, so yeah. Um, pretty simple build. The inside's in pretty good condition, just needs a clean. I'm not going to be working on the inside or painting it or anything because it's pretty good. Um, it's got handles like cut into it. Drawers are all on runners. Like you can see it just needs a clean. Runners are a bit tight. Yeah, it's all good, just dirty. Um, don't really need to do any repairs or anything. The backing is in perfect condition. Um, as you can see, the doors are a little off kilter, but I should be able to make those fit better by adjusting these hinges. So I'll stuff around with those a bit and see if I can get them to fit better. Um, not sure what's going on here with this little doodad. I think it might have been like a, a door latch that's not working. What's under there? Oh, look, blue tack. Nice. At least it's not um, chewing gum. So yeah, it looks like there was a latch there. So I'll have to replace the latches. Hoping that I can come up with something pretty cool. We shall see. Okay, so the first thing I had to take care of was the hinges. I really wanted to start by adjusting the hinges and making the doors sit the way they should be sitting. But the holes for the screws were stripped completely out and they needed to be filled up so that I could re-drill them. I'm using this two-part kneadable epoxy stuff. I'm not sure what it's called. I picked it up from Audi for I think like $4 or something like that so I figured I'd give it a go and am actually I was actually impressed with it. It worked really well and it was good for just this small amount. Because I'm usually working with Bondo and you can kind of push Bondo into holes and stuff like this, um, this is a lot thicker so I kind of had to roll a little sausage and like poke it in there and then shove it in with a screwdriver and you know just keep adding more to it until it was filled up as always, described with such class. Gee, I wonder why this runner isn't working properly. That could be it. Okay, so this is the drawer we were just looking at. And I just automatically assumed that the drawers, like the sides and the back, were going to be made of solid wood because that would to me be the smart thing to do but they're made out of pressed wood or particle board um, the problem here is as you can see here it is split and the reason it's split there is because this runner was screwed in along here you can see where they were screwed in. This was the only screw left. These ones had come out because they're screwed into the open particle board. And the reason it's split right there is because not only does screwing it into the particle board create a weak point, but it's already got a weak point along here because of this groove where the baseboard slides in so you've got this like that section there if you picture that 
there. Like that's already going to be pretty weak there because you've got this groove cut in here and then you go adding screws in there. As soon as you put the screw in there that's going to split that apart. So I need to work out what to do about that to strengthen it because whilst there are screw holes on this surface and I could put screws in there um, I don't really have any screws short enough to go in there and if the head of the screw isn't the right size to fit in that slightly countersunk surface then the screw head is going to sit up above that surface and the runner isn't going to move very smoothly along there because it's going to hit the screw heads. The other problem with screwing down into it this way is if you picture the screw going down through there that's going to go pretty much down close to where that groove is cut. So again, a weak point. Okay, so part of me wanted to go to Bunnings and buy some hardwood and replace all of these draw sides with solid wood and redo all of this to make them nice and strong. But I checked all the other runners and all the other draw sides and they were all fine. It would just... It was just this one that really had an issue, so I just wanted to strengthen this one. So what I've done to strengthen this particle board and make it so that I can attach the runner again is I've basically watered down some wood glue and forced it down into that surface as much as I could, smoothed it all out, and then I've gone in with some Bondo. The reason I've done that is because the wood glue will kind of saturate it and penetrate it, the particle board more than the Bondo will and it will also make it easier for the Bondo to get into all of that open grain or whatever you want to call it. I reattached the hinges and put the doors back on, adjusted everything and got them sitting heaps better. Okay so before I go any further or even bother cleaning the inside You'll notice on this side there are holes in the backing board. So I'd say that's to allow for like um, old radios or something like that where it needs to have airflow. Um, but there's none on this side. So what I'm going to do to allow for at the very least power cords, if someone wants to use this for like an entertainment station if they want to put um, <laughs> DVD player if anyone still uses that we still have one or like gaming consoles or play uh, anything like that if they want to put anything like that in there they can run the cord through the back and they don't have to like make a mess and put a hole in there so I'm going to allow for that now and put a couple of holes in just one on the top and one on the bottom now I'm scuff sanding this entire piece and usually I would just scuff sand with a sanding block but because it's got so many big flat surfaces and it is kind of uneven in a lot of spots I'm using the orbital sander to get that done faster. And yes before anyone says anything I have cleaned it thoroughly by this point I just haven't put in the fancy little picture. I'm going to be doing something pretty cool with this piece because of how big it is and I'm really excited about it because I haven't done this for a while and it's a chance for me to use my drop saw station. Okay, it's a new day. And I spent a great deal of time yesterday procrastinating because I didn't know where to start with this piece. I know roughly what I want to do with it but it's just a matter of where I start and how I go about doing it. So those of you who have been with me for a long, long, long time might remember back when I was doing wood quilts. I don't remember how many photos I've got, so yeah. Um, I haven't done a wood quilt in a long bloody time and I used to really enjoy doing them but they are very time consuming but I've got this piece that's 
kind of boring to look at. And it's not an actual old mid-century modern piece. Um, it's actually fairly new. So I feel like it's the perfect opportunity to do a nice big wood quilt. Um, yeah. So I've seen other people when they do wood quilts, they, um, they like plan out their design and all that and work out what they're doing before they start doing it. I can't, I just can't do that. Um, my brain does not work that way. Um, so I kind of just wing it and see what happens. And that is exactly what I'm going to do with this one. And I'm going to do the best I can to take you through the process with me. I've just finished a shift at the cafe and I'm looking like crap. But um, anyway, let's do this. Alright, I'm going to do the best I can to explain what I'm doing throughout this entire process. But, you know, for someone who does not necessarily tutorials, but YouTube videos, I am not great at explaining things. Um, I don't think I necessarily do tutorials. I just kind of do things and show you things and you're just along for the ride, so to speak. So the first thing I do when I'm doing one of these things is finding my center point. This is kind of hard on this one because it's got that gap in between the drawers and it's also kind of uneven in spots. This would be a lot easier on a big flat board like a sheet of plywood or something like that. So if you haven't done something like this before and you really want to have a go at doing wood quilts, I highly recommend starting off with something kind of small and starting off on just a board or something like that or even picture frames. I've done one in a picture frame before and it worked out great. Something that I learnt from doing previous wood quilts and also whilst working on this one is no matter how good your measurements are, how straight you keep your lines and how accurate, accurate you are with everything down to the millimeter, as you progress through your wood quilt there is going to be a high chance that you're going to start shifting one way or another and things are going to start looking a bit skewed. So even if one cut is like a fraction of a millimeter out, every time you have something that's a fraction of a millimeter out, that difference is going to keep adding up as you progress through your wood quilt. Now, just a quick side note. As you'll see, there are some bruises on my arms. No, that is not from my husband. I, like I said, I did something to a nerve in my back or in my arm somewhere. Pretty sure it was in my arm. And I went to a massage therapist and he worked on my arm, especially as you can see. And apparently my muscles in my arms were so tight. It was painful. As you can see, it left me with a lot of bruises, but it did help a great deal. Anyway, back to business. Um, although I had already started working on my main cuts, I realized that what I would be better off doing is framing out at least the bottom part of this top drawer so that I had something to work against because I knew I wanted to have a border around this so that when all of the pieces are on, there aren't little gaps at the end if that makes any sense. It just looks neater, I think. Um, this trim that I'm using, I basically cut myself with my Japanese pull saw and it's one centimeter thick. Now, whilst I am going to be using the miter saw on a lot of the cuts on this piece, I am also going to be hand cutting a lot of them as well. So, my miter saw is a piece of crap. I don't know if you can tell. Um, it's just horrible and I really need to replace it with something better. And eventually I will, but for now it does the job. But I do have to mark all of my lines because I can't see where I'm cutting. Um, I can't see where the blade's going to go. I don't have a laser line or anything fancy like that. So I have to mark the line and then get down to basically eye level manually pull the guard up, drop the blade down without pulling the trigger and see where the blade's going to sit and then turn it on and drop the, drop the blade. It's a whole process that is an absolute pain in the ass, but it got the job done. So in this case, 
my combination square came in handy. It was one of the main things I used throughout this whole process and I highly recommend getting one if you don't have one. The two main cuts you're going to make if you're doing this is a 90 degree angle and a 45 degree angle. You will have to adjust the saw either way like for the 45 degree angles and for the 90 degree angles I found it easier to just clamp it to the bench the corner of the bench where you can see my clamp at the end and just use my Japanese pull saw to cut it you don't have to use Japanese pull saw it just happens to be my favorite hand saw at the moment if you ever hear me mentioning things like combination squares or Japanese pull saws or miter saw or anything like that don't be intimidated by them. They are really basic tools that anyone can use. And I will of course put links for all of the tools used in the description. So at this point in time, I was using staples in my staple gun. I really wanted to use brad nails in it instead, but I didn't have any on hand and I didn't feel like running out to get some, so I just made do. The staples are sitting proud of the surface and I have to deal with that later. I want small gaps in between each piece rather than them just being butted up against each other so that they stand out more. And I'm just using a straight off cut to use it as a gap thingy, majiggy, you know what I mean. Another suggestion I have for you would be to not work on one side and then move over to the other side. Go from side to side as you progress through the design because I find it easier that way to remember what you need to do. Otherwise you can easily stuff up your design and make slight differences and this way I think it flows better. Make sure you also clean up your glue runoff as you go because once that glue dries it can make the edges and the lines look really untidy. Now there's about to be a whole bunch of very speedy stapling and nailing and not much sound because by this point I had my music playing in the background so you're going to have to just listen to me talk. If you don't want to listen to me talk, mute me, but you should listen because I am wise beyond my years. So obviously I haven't posted a video for a few weeks and there is a reason for that. I've been very distracted whilst trying to help someone I thought was a new friend but as it turns out, without going into too much detail, they were lying to me and basically abusing my trust and my willingness to help. Now, I have no ill will towards this person and I hope for the best for them, but they are going through a really hard time and I divulged a lot of personal information with them and I thought there was a mutual respect and amount of trust there, but apparently that was very one-sided. It did take quite a huge toll on my mental, emotional health um, and pulled me down into a very, very dark hole that I struggled to get out of and really messed with my head. So I had to take a step back and just stop helping them because they needed the help. They had plenty of help offered to them from myself and other people around them, but they clearly don't want help and need to help themselves because as I've learned over the years you can't help someone that doesn't want to help themselves but now that I have stepped back from that situation I have stopped helping this person to the detriment of my own mental health and I am on track to getting better myself and getting refocused back into my work and my passion but my message to you guys is by all means, help someone that you think needs help, but make sure that you aren't letting them pull you down with them and make sure you aren't losing focus on what's important for you and for your family and in your life.
Now, as you can see, I have a lot of holes to fill. I started off using spack filler, but I shouldn't have because I really hate this stuff. It's powdery and gross and it's just not easy to work with. So then I moved on to Timbermate wood filler and I didn't like that either. And then I moved on to what I should have just used right from the start, Bondo, or as we call it here in Australia, Timber, uh, wood filler, wood filler, I think it, no, builder's filler. I can't remember. It's one from Bunnings. I then of course had a buttload of sanding to do and I think I used 120 grit sandpaper for this. Once all the sanding was done, I then of course had to go through, touch up some spots with some Bondo and then I went around all the really visible edges with some spack filler just to fill the gaps underneath. Once every little crack and crevice was filled and sanded and filled and sanded and filled and sanded, it just felt like it went on for days. Um, it was ready to start priming and I'm using Carts and Molly Primer and Adhesive Bond. I'm going to be using a darker colour on this piece, so I'm using the grey primer. The paint that I'm going to be using is a chalk paint and does not require a primer all the time. But in this case, because I have done so much sanding and stuff and I have so many uneven surfaces, I am choosing to prime just so that I have an even surface to start with. Before I flip this piece back up onto its feet to make my life easier, I am dealing with the legs now. I took off the old floor protectors, which were kind of sticky and gross and falling off and replaced them with new ones. I forgot to record myself priming the legs, but that's nothing to write home about. But now that they're primed, I'm using White Knight Metal Guard in brass to make these legs look a little nicer. I'm hoping that the end effect will make them look like they are nice, fancy metal legs. I also could have been a lot neater about this, but that's not how I roll. Alright, so it's all taped off. Kind of. Um, why haven't I shown the taping off? Um, because taping off sucks. But, I would like to show you this, which I think is a neat trick. For this piece I'm going to be using Blake and Taylor furniture paint in the colour charcoal. This is a chalk paint and this is my first time using it. Now as you know I've set up to spray this piece but when I got down to the shed that morning I discovered that the water mains were turned off because there was work being done on the pipes or whatever so I had to resort to brush and roller. So I'm doing all my edges first using a round sleek brush. Can't tell you what size it is, wouldn't have a clue. Um, I'm starting with my edges first so that I can run my hand along that edge when I'm done with the edges to clean up any paint that runs over. And this way I can make sure that the face of the doors and drawers are nice and tidy, if that makes any sense. I feel like I say that a lot. As usual, I'm using my favorite Two Fussy Blokes roller. with a 5mm nap or smooth roller sleeve.
As you can tell, it was raining this day and it gets quite loud on the shed roof. When I'm using a fresh roller sleeve, I like to make sure that I really, really saturate that sleeve, otherwise it can leave a weird texture on your surface. My first impressions of this paint is it applies really, really well with both a brush and a roller. It seems to glide across the surface really easily and it doesn't grab or drag or anything like that. That said, it was a really cool day this day, so there wasn't really a lot of heat to cause a lot of drag or to make it dry out really fast. I also don't use chalk paint a lot, so, you know, I'm used to mineral paint, which tends to get a bit of drag. But so far, I'm really impressed with this paint. When I'm rolling thin edges like this, I like to make sure I've got the least amount of paint on my roller as possible. Because the surface area is so much smaller, you really, really need like the bare minimum of paint on your roller. If you load up your roller before doing edges like this, that's how you're going to end up with paint spilling over the edges and it's just going to be a mess. So what I like to do is I do the bigger surfaces like I did on the top and then, you know, basically use as much as I can out of it and then go straight over to the edge instead of loading up. This makes for a really nice, clean, thin coat on the edges. For the doors and draw fronts, I'm using a combination of the roller and this 55mm Unipro chalk brush. When I was loading up the chalk brush, I was being careful about how much I put on there and I actually brought, dabbed a lot of it off back onto the foil because when I was using the brush in those little gaps, I don't want the gaps to be overloaded with paint and have it pulling in there and it just looking messy. So. Basically I was using the chalk brush with a little bit of paint on it just to fill the gaps and get in all those little grooves and then I'd grab the roller and roll it over the top to smooth everything out. After finishing this door, I also discovered that using a small artist brush to go through the gaps and along the edges of the other parts before going in with the big brush and the roller was a lot easier. When you're working on something like this that has heaps of little nooks and crannies like what's on the front of the doors and the drawer fronts, I highly suggest getting a really bright light and going around and checking all the different angles because you'd be surprised how many little spots you miss. It's top coat time and I'm using Blake and Taylor clear top coat. This was the next day and luckily the water mains were turned back on so I was able to spray the top coat. Even if your top coat or paint is brand spanking new fresh out of the can or bottle, always run it through a paint strainer when you're spraying. Don't forget your respirator. Yes, I need a new one. I tried to make some alterations on it to allow for my glasses and it did not work out. You're about to see me stuff up big time, but I am leaving it in and explaining everything because I am human 
and I want to be as transparent as possible. So at this point my first coat of clear coat had been drying and it took forever because of how cold it was this day and the spray gun must have built up a little bit because it wasn't spraying out evenly the way it should be as you can see here so I went and adjusted it a bit and tested it on the board and tested it on a couple of different surfaces but apparently I didn't check it enough. As you can kind of make out here the spray gun splattered a little bit or sputtered and you can see it right there. I've put this down to user error and maybe a little bit of blockage forming whilst it was sitting there in between coats but the biggest stuff up it did I and I know better I should have just left it but I wiped it back and because I didn't leave it long enough in between coats honestly I should have left it longer the fresh clear coat sitting on top like that and then me going over it with a damp cloth like I am here has kind of reactivated the first coat of clear coat and just wiped it straight off. As you can see here I've managed to peel the top coat off and that is the chalk paint underneath. I was ready to pack up and quit. I left it to dry completely and smooth sanded it as much as I could but it kind of just made it worse. So in the end the way I fixed it was just to roll a fresh coat of the paint on the top surface only and then left that to dry and just went back over it with the clear coat. Here is that same corner all sorted and now I can stop being dramatic and get back to work. I just want to make sure I'm making it abundantly clear. That issue with the top coat was user error entirely. That is all on me. It has nothing to do with the top coat itself. The top coat so far, in my opinion, is absolutely bloody brilliant and I really like it. It goes on really well and once it's been left alone to sit overnight, it feels really durable and it has a really nice finish. Once I had all my clear coating done, I was really nervous about touching it again, so I stopped halfway through that day and went home and now I'm back the next day and it's looking great and it's feeling great and it's all good. It's finally time to put the doors and the drawers back on and I do attach new door catches but I'm not showing that in this video I will do a separate short video showing how I go about attaching them because I'm pretty sure this video is already too bloody long. Just another quick reminder of what it looked like before and also a reminder that it was manufactured in 2004. It is not a mid-century modern piece so don't come at me in the comments.